Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it is really an honor to be here presenting uh, my research to the Global Task Force on Cholera Control Case Management Working Group. I'm a professor of emergency medicine and health services policy and practice at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island in the United States. I also direct the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at Brown University, which seeks to uh, develop research and training, particularly to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance worldwide. This uh, research that I'm going to present to you is based on about 10 years of studies that I've been doing on this topic in both uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, here are my disclosures in terms of all of the funding that I've received in the past uh, for the research that I'm going to present to you. So first, uh, some background, which will be familiar to many of you, but maybe some nuances that I'll emphasize, which will uh, be useful. As we know, uh, the global burden of diarrheal disease, even though it's improved over the past decades, still remains quite high. 6.5 billion cases of diarrhea in children and adults each year, and 1.4 million deaths as of 2019. And important to note that three quarters of those cases or more than five and a half billion cases and two thirds of the deaths or more than a million deaths actually occur in patients over five years of age, uh, which is not as well known by many people. We think of this as a disease of young children, which it certainly is, but also has important ramifications uh, for older children and adults. In fact, uh, globally, diarrheal diseases are the eighth leading cause of death worldwide and in low-income countries where we're especially interested, they're the fifth leading cause of death. And among those top causes of death, they're one of the ones that we have the most ability to really affect in these low-income settings. As we all know, antibiotics can play a role in certain cases of diarrhea, but rarely do they actually decrease mortality. In fact, accurate assessment of dehydration and appropriate rehydration are by far the most important components of diarrhea management as both under and over treatment can have serious consequences. This is a famous meta-analysis by Fonseca et al., which demonstrated that in children under five, over treatment, i.e. giving IV fluids to children who only had some dehydration, resulted in longer hospital stays, as well as more adverse events, including seizures and death, compared to patients who received just oral rehydration solution alone. So this has very important consequences in that we want to make the right diagnosis so that we can provide the correct management. Unfortunately, there are few empirically derived tools for assessing dehydration in young children with diarrhea. And prior to my research, absolutely none were validated in low resource settings. In addition to that, there were no empirically derived tools at all for assessing dehydration in older children or adults. We all know that WHO recommends a four symptom algorithm for assessing dehydration in children and adults, but it was based on expert opinion and never validated against a physiologic gold standard, even though it's now been in use for more than 30 years. As we all know, the WHO IMCI guidelines includes uh, this algorithm, uh, which involves looking at four signs, mental status, eye level, thirst, and skin pinch, and classifying patients as severe, some, or no dehydration based on that. The WHO IMAI guidelines for adults and adolescents uses almost the exact same copy and pasted algorithm for assessing older children and adults as the one that was originally developed for children under five. Of course, we know that the physiology of older children and adults might be different, as well as the types of diarrheal illness that they get, i.e. more bacterial versus viral, et cetera, that may make a difference in terms of how we evaluate them for dehydration. Um, these algorithms are not just academic. They have a really important uh, function in terms of triaging patients and creating separate management strategies. For patients with no dehydration, which will be the vast majority of patients with acute diarrhea, whether it be cholera or non-cholera diarrhea, plan A is used, which is just expectant management. Plan A is essentially free. It just requires giving the parent or the patient advice on continued feeding and instructions to return, but does not require ORS, does not require any specific observation or management in a healthcare facility. 
Plan B, of course, involves oral rehydration at the health center or clinic level or cholera treatment center, depending on the situation, for patients with some but not severe dehydration. And even though um, that won't be very many patients, it's estimated to be about 20% of children under five with diarrhea and about 5% of patients over five with diarrhea, that still, because of the huge numbers of cases of diarrhea each year, that still results in 200 million cases of some dehydration in children under five and 285 million cases of some dehydration each year in patients over five years of age. Plan C or intravenous rehydration in the hospital is truly reserved for those patients with severe dehydration, greater than 9% dehydration, according to WHO. And that is gonna be a very small percentage of all the patients with diarrhea. But again, it adds up given how many patients there are with diarrhea. That is about 0.05% um, of uh, adults and older children, which still ends up being almost 3 million cases each year will have severe dehydration. And among the nearly 1 billion cases of diarrhea in children under five, about 0.5% or 4.7 million total cases will progress to severe dehydration. Not only does this require IV fluids, which have greater cost, but it requires skilled people who can put in IVs in young children or older children and adults. It requires a hospital bed. It requires nursing staff to monitor the inflow of fluids, sometimes IV pumps, or if you don't have an IV pump, then a really skilled nurse who's going to watch that fluid going in to make sure the child is not overhydrated. So this is a huge use of resources, and we really want to reserve it for those who need it most. So before I can describe the research on assessing dehydration, we have to talk about what is the gold standard? How do we actually know how dehydrated a child is? What is the criterion standard that we can use for research purposes to develop diagnostic tools that can assess dehydration in children and adults? If you think about it, dehydration is essentially the loss of water and salt in diarrhea, a little bit in vomiting. One liter of water weighs exactly one kilogram, which is very helpful. So the ideal measure of percent dehydration would be taking the healthy weight of a patient then measuring them again when they were acutely ill with diarrhea, and then dividing that by the healthy weight. Unfortunately, we don't have the healthy weight of patients. We almost never know what they weighed before they got the diarrhea, only after they arrive in the clinic or facility with diarrhea. So instead, we use something that's almost as good, which is the stable post-hydration slash recovery weight instead. This is an example of one patient in Rwanda in one of my studies. As you can see here, when the child arrived, they weighed seven kilograms. Uh, they had acute diarrhea at that point. There was no way to know for certain what their dehydration severity was, but we rehydrated them in the hospital and their weight slowly gained over the next uh, few days until they reached their uh, pre-illness weight, which in this case was about 7.7 .7 kilos. And then their kidneys kicked in and began to diurese the excess fluid and you can see that it stabilized their weight. We can use that stable weight as a proxy for their pre-illness weight in order to get their percent dehydration. And it turns out that there's pretty excellent correlation in at least one study done in the US between the pre-illness weight in a child and this post-illness weight or stable weight. Of course, this is a factor that can only be done in retrospect. It can't be used by clinicians on arrival. Uh, but it is very useful from research purposes as a physiologic gold standard for us to actually do research and to identify the accuracy of different types of diagnostic tests. And then just very briefly, for those who aren't familiar with a lot of diagnostic research, most diagnostic research uses the receiver operator characteristic curves as a way of assessing the accuracy of different clinical models. And this is a curve that plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate for any given test. If that curve is a straight line across like this red dotted line, that is actually random chance. That's the same as rolling a pair of dice. It means that the clinical prediction model is essentially useless. The higher uh, the area under the curve, the better the clinical model. An area under the curve of one is a perfect classifier, which doesn't exist in the real world. 
an area under the curve of greater than 0.75 is generally considered pretty good for a clinical prediction model. If you want an area under the curve of greater than 0.9, you almost always are going to need to use laboratory tests, which are not really available in our settings. So what is the prior evidence before I started my research? Um, so we had a study from Canada on 102 children under 36 months of age. 10% um, of them had moderate dehydration. They looked at 12 clinical signs and used some regression modeling to find a combination of four signs, general appearance, eyes, mucous membranes, and tears that performed the best with an area under the curve of 0.83, which is pretty good. Um, in general, the accuracy will always be better in the initial derivation study than in the future validation study uh, for statistical reasons that I can't get into today. Um, importantly, it, it should be noted that this was a study looking to predict moderate dehydration, not severe dehydration. And that's because to enroll enough patients in Canada with severe dehydration, you would have probably had to enroll thousands, if not tens of thousands of children in order to be able to assess that. So they focused on moderate dehydration. This clinical dehydration scale, uh, which was de developed by the individuals in Toronto, uh, was then validated in a multi-center study in Montreal, Quebec, and Geneva. And the clinical dehydration scale, or CDS, was able to classify children with mild dehydration and moderate dehydration relatively well. So it validated pretty well. However, this was only in a high resource setting. And I was particularly interested in how these tools might work in low resource settings, um, especially when used not by pediatric emergency physicians, as in the case of the clinical dehydration scale, but when used by nurses and other less skilled providers in a clinic setting. And so uh, I did a study in Rwanda in 2013, which enrolled 136 children presenting with acute diarrhea to three rural health clinics slash hospitals in Rwanda. 10% of them had severe dehydration or death. And what we found is that while the clinical dehydration scale and the World Health Organization, IMCI, performed relatively well when used by doctors, um, they actually performed relatively poorly, especially the WHO IMCI when used by nurses. Um, and WHO in particular had an area under the curve of 0.65, but the confidence intervals crossed 0.5 and so it was statistically no better than chance. That research uh, allowed me to get funding from the NIH to launch a large study, the Dehydration Assessing Kids Accurately Study, or DACA study. And this took place, and the goal of this study was to drive a new clinical diagnostic model for use by nurses and other less skilled providers to assess the severity of dehydration in children under five years with acute diarrhea in a resource-limited setting. And then to validate the new model in a new population of children and compare its accuracy and reliability to the WHO IMCI guidelines. So the setting for this study um, was the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, Dhaka Hospital. The reason for that is developing machine learning models requires a lot of data. And so we needed hundreds and hundreds of children with acute diarrhea in order to be able to develop stable models. There are very few centers in the world where you can enroll hundreds and hundreds of children with acute diarrhea in a relatively short time period. DACA Hospital is one of them. It provides free care to urban and rural population of 17 million people in DACA and the surrounding villages. Our inclusion and exclusion criteria were relatively simple. We were looking at children under five years, we did exclude neonates in this study. They had to present with diarrhea, and we used exclusion criteria based on WHO guidelines at that time. We excluded children who had chronic diarrhea, who had less than three loose stools per day because they didn't meet the definition of diarrhea. And we also excluded children who had a clear alternative diagnosis to gastroenteritis. This includes you know, children who may have come in with diarrhea but actually had appendicitis or had a uh, upper respiratory or pneumonia syndrome, and we didn't want to enroll those patients. We randomly selected patients on arrival and consented their parents, and then each child when they arrived was weighed before they received any treatment on a standard electronic scale. We then performed a clinical exam. Uh, this was performed by nurses, and particularly nurses that were outside of the ICDDRB clinical pool 
because we felt that ICD-DRB nurses were not representative of nurses worldwide. And so we hired nurses from Bangladesh who were outside of the ICD-DRB clinical pool to do these assessments. Then after that, uh, the children were rehydrated in the rehydration unit at ICD-DRB, which is incredibly large and amazing for those who've never seen it before. Um, there are hundreds of children in there at any given time. And they were rehydrated based on the clinical staff at the hospital. They were not informed of any of our clinical assessments by our nurses. We then weighed the children every eight hours until they reached a stable weight, um, and then used that to determine our gold standard of how dehydrated they were on arrival. We enrolled a total of 850 children. We were able to get that stable or final weight on about 771 of them, of whom 85 had severe dehydration and 347 had some dehydration. We then took the clinical predictors that we had assessed on arrival and entered them into our models. Two of the clinical predictors ended up being quite rare, and so we did not enter these into the models, um, but we entered the other clinical predictors into our models. I'm not going to describe how we performed the machine learning modeling. It's a little bit complicated, but I will refer you to our uh, article, um, our research at the end that uh, you can review. The machine learning modeling produced what we call the DACA score. It included four different signs, general appearance, respirations, skin pinch, and tears, and assigned a score to each of those signs. Uh, this was based on the machine learning modeling that allowed us to add them up and decide how severely dehydrated a patient was. Um, when we looked at the accuracy of the DACA score um, in a receiver operating characteristic curve, you can see it was pretty good with an area under the curve of 0.79 for severe dehydration and 0.78 for predicting some dehydration. And one of the things that was important is we wanted models that could do both really well, since both of those diagnoses are important in different ways. Um, the sensitivity and specificity based on the cut points of a cut point of four on the scale for severe dehydration and two on the scale for some dehydration were also relatively decent. We then uh, conducted a second study a few years later um, on patients uh, also presenting to ICD-DRB in order to validate this new DACA score. This time we enrolled 546 patients, including about 500 that had sufficient data for analysis. Again, about 70 of those had severe dehydration, 184 had some dehydration. And the uh, and the goal of this study was really to validate the DACA score, but also to compare it to WHO IMCI in a fair head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, we used similar methods to what we used in the derivation study in terms of performing the assessment on arrival and then weighing every child on arrival in every eight hours until they achieved a stable weight. And what we found is that the accuracy of the DACA score, um, so here we use the ordinal C index. This is a way to combine the area under the receiver operating curve for both some dehydration and severe dehydration. Uh, so it can give you sort of an average accuracy for an ordinal model that's looking at, you know, a three level outcome. So the, but otherwise it's assessed the same way. Perfect would be 1.0, 0.5 is no better than chance. And the DACA score had an ordinal C index that was statistically better than the WHO algorithms ordinal C index. The reliability of the DACA score was also much better. Every patient that arrived was assessed by two separate nurses who were blinded or masked to each other's assessments. With the DACA score, you had almost perfect uh, reliability or agreement between the assessments by the two nurses. For the WHO algorithm, it was somewhat worse. Um, and I can talk a little bit at the end about why I think that might have been the case. The bottom line, is that universal use of the DACA score based on these results would detect an additional 436,000 cases of severe dehydration in young children that are currently being missed every year by the WHO IMCI guidelines. So this was published in Lancet Global Health several years ago, um, and I will refer you to that article for more details on our methodology. After that, we received NIH funding for a new study, this time for assessing dehydration in older children and adults. This was called the Novel Innovative Research for Understanding Dehydration in Adults and Kids, or NARUDAC, which happens to be the word for dehydrated in Bangla. 
Uh, the goal of this study was number one, to use machine learning techniques to derive and internally validate um, new clinical diagnostic models for patients over five years of age, which again, had never been done before, but also this time to adapt those models into a mobile health app that could be easily used at the bedside by clinicians um, and could not only predict the dehydration category or what type of IV fluids the patient should receive, IV fluids, ORS, or none, but also the exact volume deficit of the patient to tell us how much fluid they should receive. And then we also, of course, wanted to validate its accuracy and reliability in a new population, and again, compare it to the WHO IMAI guidelines for patients over five years. So again, uh, this study was conducted at ICDDRB. We had similar inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, again, we assessed patients on arrival. We hired nurses outside of the standard uh, ICDDRB nursing pool. This time, we assessed a wider range of symptoms because we just had less research in older children and adults to know what was likely to work and what wasn't. So we assessed uh, a total of 16 different clinical predictors um, in these older children and adults who presented. Again, we defined percent dehydration as the post-illness weight or stable weight minus the admission weight divided by the post-illness weight. And this time we also had an analysis for volume deficit, which was the percent dehydration times their healthy or post-illness weight. We categorized severe dehydration as greater than 9%, some as three to 9%, and no dehydration as less than 3% uh, based on WHO guidelines. This is our flow diagram for the NERUDAC study. In total, uh, we were able to enroll 2,172 patients, including 639 children uh, between 5 and 19, 762 adults between 20 and 60, and 771 older adults or elderly patients over 60. Um, and uh, of those, 277 had severe dehydration, 1431 had some dehydration, and 431 had no dehydration. You'll note this is a somewhat sicker population than our studies in children. It's not surprising. It takes a lot more for an adult to actually come to a health facility for their diarrhea than for a parent to bring their child to that health facility for the same diarrhea. Um, so we started by deriving age-specific models. And when we started this, because we had no prior research, we didn't know if there would be different models that would work best in older children, adults, and elderly patients. There were thoughts that you know maybe skin pinch doesn't work as well in elderly patients, something like that. And so we wanted to derive separate models in each of these populations. We also derived what we call the full Nerudak model, which is a single model for all three of these older populations. Um, you know, basically that could be used for every patient over five. And then we derived a simple Nerudak model. And the reason for this is we felt that some of the um, variables that we were using in our other models, such as blood pressure, especially may not be available in all settings. And so we wanted a simple model that could be used without any equipment, basically. We used forward stepwise regression techniques, some very complicated statistics in order to identify the optimal model, and then ordinal regression to predict dehydration severity, non summer severe, and linear regression to predict total volume deficit in liters. So these were the final variables selected by each of our different models. Um, I will only say that um, each of these models was somewhat different. You'll notice that there were certain uh, there were certain um, variables that were selected by all models. Skin pinch actually turns out to be the best predictor in all ages um, of patients over five. Um, however, when we actually looked at the area under the curve for the uh, older child, adult, and older adult models, they were really no different than the full model. And so we ended up dropping these age-specific models because if they don't produce better results, there's no point in making things more complicated. And so we just stuck with the full model and the simple model, which can be used in all patients over five years of age. We next conducted some qualitative research. We did eight focus groups with physicians and nurses at a number of different hospitals around Bangladesh. The focus groups were conducted in Zoom. And the goal of these focus groups was to collect data on the optimal user interface and output screens for a new 
uh, M Health app. So we wanted to incorporate these models into an app that would be easy for clinicians to use. Uh, we also wanted to understand what the balance of sensitivity versus specificity was. How many patients were clinicians willing to overtreat with IV fluids in order to prevent the undertreatment of one patient without uh, with severe dehydration? Um, and that's actually an important question that you know I can't decide. And so I wanted to. Uh, get the best representative sample of clinicians who manage diarrhea every day in both adults and children to understand what their preference would be. Um, that's not an empiric question. This is an opinion question that really involves trade-offs, uh, both in terms of use of resources, as well as how many patients with severe dehydration were willing to miss and allow to potentially die um, in order to not overtreat a lot of other patients without severe dehydration. We also got their opinion on other components that we were going to incorporate into this into this app, including things like danger signs, recommendations on antibiotics, et cetera. Um, and this is sort of a matrix for how this clinical decision support tool, which we then developed based on the uh, results of our DACA research and our NERUDEC research, essentially it can be used on an Android platform, an iOS platform, or on the web. There's an input screen. Once you enter the age of the patient, it automatically decides whether to use the DACA model or the NERUDAC models. And then it tells you what the symptoms are that you should enter in. And when you enter in those symptoms, it gives you an output screen, which tells you if the patient is has none, some, or severe dehydration and what their exact fluid deficit is in liters. And then some helpful instructions on how to rehydrate them, how to give that fluid over what period of time. It'll also give you some instructions when it's indicated on what sort of antibiotics to give and whether the patient should be managed in a hospital setting, at a health clinic setting, or at home. Um, this is just a blown up example of that um, for a patient with some dehydration. In addition to developing this app, we also developed a, a, a um, paper-based uh, score for based on our simplified NERUDAC model for uh, clinicians who don't have a smartphone. And this is similar to our DACA score. Uh, it uses the um, variables from our simplified and RUDAC score. Less than four in this case is no dehydration. A score of four to six is some dehydration and greater than six is severe dehydration. And you'll notice here that there are some um, signs like urine output and radial pulse which and re respiration depth which don't appear in the WHO IMAI guidelines and a couple like skin pinch and eye level that do appear in the WHO IMAI guidelines. And I can talk again a little bit about why I think that might be the case. We then did our validation study um, and we enrolled a total of 1600 patients uh, in the validation study of whom we had enough data on analysis to an analyze about 1580 patients again, with sort of similar levels, a um, little bit lower level of severe dehydration in this case, it was a different season, uh, different characteristics in terms of, you know, how much um, cholera there was. And so we had sort of slightly different rates of severe dehydration, which is a good thing because you want to validate your model in a slightly different population than the one that you originally derived it in. As you can see here, uh, when we look at the full and simplified NERUDAC models in this validation study, they performed almost identical. Uh, they both had an area under the curve of 0.74 at, for severe dehydration, uh, 0.69 for some dehydration, and they both performed much better than the WHO algorithm in this case, which is represented by the gray bar with 95% confidence intervals, the gray curve with 95% confidence intervals. Um, overall, the sensitivity and specificity of the uh, of the NERUDAC model uh, was better uh, than the WHO uh, IMAI algorithm as well, both for severe dehydration and some dehydration. And again, the sort of bottom line here, the overall accuracy for predicting dehydration was significantly better in the NERUDAC models, um, either full or simple compared to the WHO model. And this was statistically significant at a p-value of less than 0.0001. Also, the reliability was much better for the full and simple NERUDAC model than the WHO algorithm. In fact, the WHO algorithm in this case had 
uh, what would be considered only moderate reliability, not even good reliability here, uh, whereas the Nerudak models had excellent reliability. And I can talk a little bit more afterwards about why that might be the case. And again, the bottom line is that use, universal use of the Nerudak models would detect an additional 142,000 to 171,000 patients per year with severe dehydration that WHO IMAI is currently missing. And that depends on whether you use the full model or the simple model. And it would prevent the overtreatment of 627 to 912 million patients per year without any dehydration who don't need any management but would be overtreated by the WHO IMAI algorithm. This validation study is going to be published tomorrow in Lancet Global Health. So you are the first people in the world outside of our study team and the reviewers at Lancet to see these results. Please do not share this screenshot until tomorrow. Otherwise, Lancet will be very mad at me. Uh, but you will be able to find it online tomorrow on the Lancet website and read all of the details of our analysis. In addition to that, once it's published online, we will be going live and there'll be links in the article to our uh, calculator. Um, so that will be posted on the uh, Google App Store pretty quickly. The iOS Store, it takes a little bit more time, uh, but there will also be a website, www.fluidcalc.org, where you'll be able to uh, use the um, a web version of the app online for free. All of the data that went into creating these models will also be freely available uh, tomorrow when you go online. You'll be able to get links in the Lancet Global Health article to all of the data for any scientists who want to perform secondary analyses or think they can use newer machine learning techniques to develop a better model with my data. Very happy for that to happen. I just want to see better measurement tools out there for dehydration. Um, I will end there and take any questions um, in the remaining time. I also have some additional slides I'm happy to share, um, including ones that are specific to cholera, if anybody is interested in that. Um, thank you so much.